Hello, I'm Joshua Unruh, Superhero Scholar. Welcome to Superhero University on Wonder Woman Rebirth, Year One. Session Three, The Big Finish. Have a seat. Class is now in session. Welcome back, everyone, for Session 3 of Superhero University on Wonder Woman Rebirth Year 1. It's been quite a ride. I really appreciate all of you that have come along with me on it and have done a deep dive with me into this story. It has been kind of hit and miss, I think, as a piece of fiction. As much as I enjoyed some of the setup at the beginning, there's a little saggy weirdness in the middle. Then we had a little turn off to the cul-de-sac with Barbara and Minerva, Ph.D. So it's it's been interesting. So we're going to finish it out this time. I had been saying that we would do the next two issues, but what I meant to say was we were going to do the last three. The final two issues really blended into one story chunk to me. And I kept saying the last two issues when it was really the last three. And I apologize. I'm sorry for that confusion. But as I kind of joked in the chat with my patrons, it's also a thing I think these comics should apologize to me for. If I can forget how many issues you still have, that's kind of a problem. A little bit of cleanup from the last session, which does involve Barbara and Minerva, who from this moment on we will refer to as BAM. Not just because it's easier to say, but because it's fun to say. I had some issues in the last chapter with Bam's skepticism, that she's the one who just can't believe Diana was visited by the gods. If my patrons joining me in the chat during the week are any indication, I'm not alone. There were some comparisons between Bam and Scully on early X-Files, which I thought was really interesting. Because the thing that fascinates me about Scully is that she's always so close to whatever the weird thing is going on, but not close enough that you can blame her for not believing. And to be fair, she comes into the thing as a medical doctor and is sort of hired to be the professional skeptic to Mulder's professional believer. And so in that respect, I'm prepared to cut Scully a lot more slack than I am Bam. My point being... Bam has spent her entire professional life trying to prove that a myth is real. And by all accounts, she has staked her reputation on that search. I'm not entirely sure if she's well-respected or a little bit of a laughingstock or both, depending on the day and who you're talking to. We'll come to that a little bit as we read these last few issues. But like I say, she has staked her entire professional reputation, which is apparently significant on the idea that at least one Greek myth is real. Acting like it's ridiculous as a concept seems to undermine her worldview to some extent. I don't expect her to believe that every Greek myth is real just because she expects the Amazons to be real. But at the same time, don't you think she would have a little bit of an open mind about it? Whereas Etta Candy, who is a professional in military intelligence who relies on facts and figures, and data, and things like that. She makes more sense as the hardcore skeptic. I would have liked to have heard her say, not a chance, and have Bam saying, well, maybe, because then it puts Steve in a place where, as we'll see in these issues, he can be the one who believes because he saw Themyscira, and he has had a personal connection with Diana. Another little bit of cleanup from the last session talking about Bam's backstory. I'm going to quote Kate Met. Kate has some vague ideas about what Bam's backstory might be telling us about the Amazons, and I want to throw them out there so that we can chat about them as we go. So Kate asks, is the Mascara perhaps some kind of afterlife? I mean, we do know straight from, I think her name was Kazia, straight from Kazia's lips, that Kazia, at the very least, is not a survivor. 
is someone who died when a man forced himself on her and she said no. She was apparently murdered. So she is someone that has been dead and is now alive again on Themyscira. So is Themyscira kind of an afterlife? Is that why Bam didn't find anybody on the island? Because they're only sort of there physically. Are they not entirely there in this reality as we know it? And I am very possibly asking questions that Kate did not mean to ask. But when she says, is Themyscira some kind of afterlife? And we know that Bam was probably on Themyscira. It's not 100% clear, but it, I think that's a pretty good guess. It's worth asking, did she not find the Amazons because the Amazons are on that island in a way different than a living person that has not died? Is that why Hippolyta, the 10th queen, is the one in charge of the island because the other queens and Amazons that died didn't get to go to the island then? Did they not earn their afterlife? We don't have answers to this, by the way. I'm just throwing things out there. If Hippolyta was a living 10th queen of the Amazons, died, and went to Paradise Island, boy, doesn't that name take on new connotations if it's some sort of afterlife for the Amazons. Is she the only queen that got to go? Or is she the queens 1, 4, and 8 get to go, but she was the 10th queen, so she gets to be the one who sits on the throne? I don't know, but it's an interesting question, right? Kate specifically says, and I quote, So I guess those things are supposed to add up to the Themyscira Amazons being immortal warriors of legend and separated from the historical badass Amazons. Question mark, question mark, question mark? Ethan, who is actually reading some more comics with Wonder Woman in them, that might explain why Diana can't find Paradise Island again, at least as far as... Trinity number one, the trinity that, that Ethan mentions, there's a book where Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman team up. And they tend to call that Trinity. So Ethan says, maybe that's why Diana, as of Trinity number one even, can't find Paradise Island. Since she went to the mortal world, she literally can't go back. That's very good. Ethan suggests that Diana can't find Themyscira again because she's gone to the mortal plane and literally cannot return to this possible plane that is other. That's really interesting because it's very in line with Greek mythology, right? You have Orpheus going to the underworld to try and save his wife. And when she looks back and looks over her shoulder at Hades, she can't leave it. Because she showed any kind of wistfulness for what was behind her, she becomes trapped there forever. You also have Persephone, who is Demeter's daughter, kidnapped by Hades and refuses to eat. But then she eats like two or three pomegranate seeds. And now she is part of Hades' realm. She can only go to Olympus half of the year during spring, and the other half of the year during winter, she has to spend it in Hades. So it's really interesting that there is a suggestion in Greek mythology that you do not get to easily move from the realm of the living to the realm of the dead. The river Styx is the famous one, but there are two other rivers, one of which you drink of to forget your previous life. Like, you don't even get to remember who you are after you die. And the Amazons apparently get to skip that part. They do remember their lives from before they died. That's a really interesting suggestion. I wasn't putting too much weight into this idea of Themyscira as the Amazon afterlife. But I don't know. The way Ethan puts it, that that's why Diana can't go back, makes me think about that. It's very Greek mythology. We'll put it that way. In terms of what we find out in the story, though, I'm going to borrow another line from Kate. In terms of what we're given in this story, it seems very much like the story is trying to dance out of a question about the Amazons that nobody actually asked. And the reason I borrow that phrasing is because a lot of the stuff that confuses me about this story can be heaped under that heading. I'm confused about the Amazons' duty. I'm confused about their purpose. I'm confused about their technology level. I'm, there's just so much stuff that I'm confused by, and it's because we're nibbling around the edges of these concepts rather than diving head first into them. Talking about Bam's backstory, there was also some dissonance between Bam as the patron-guided friend to Wonder Woman and her eventual fate as a murderous and possibly cannibal villain. Now, I have not read every single Wonder Woman book that's come out during Rebirth, but as near as I can tell, we never actually get to see the dots between Bam and Cheetah connected on screen, so to speak. There's some talk about it, but not a lot of real detail. Backing up from that, anyone who listens to this, who has read all of Rebirth and knows where we can find those dots connected, please let me know. Tell me. I would love to hear it. 
But as I stand, having not read everything and just read a good chunk of it, basically I read the issues that were opposite year one, we don't get that on screen. And that's really frustrating because what did the patrons want her to find or do? Was it just be on the island, like step foot on it? Or was there something larger? And if they do have this larger idea of what she's supposed to do, did she do it? Did she succeed? I don't know that I really get an answer to that question in this story. I know I don't, but I'm not even sure we get a larger answer to that question. And then what does all that have to do with becoming Cheetah? And I'm going to tell you right now, my best guess is nothing. My best guess is it has nothing to do with her becoming Cheetah because there is a whole other South American jungle god involved in that thing, which I do know from the odd numbered issues. So I think nothing. And that's even more frustrating because in this story, it feels like the reason that we're talking so much about Bam is because at the meta level, we know she's going to be Cheetah. But in terms of the story, the stuff we find out here doesn't have anything to do with her becoming Cheetah. Very confusing. And it goes back to that resting on previous continuity that I mentioned in the last session. In that session, I mentioned it in terms of Steve, where we spend all of this time on Steve, but none of it makes him very interesting. And it seems like that's happening because we know we're going to need a Steve. But we only know that because of stories that technically aren't there anymore. And if I'm honest, I've been told since then that some of that may have to do with a larger rebirth mystery that kind of goes across the entire line of comics. But I also don't find that answer particularly compelling in terms of this very story. An excellent example of what I mean by that is, I believe Kate, but it it may have been Susie, brought up the idea of Bam's dad as Chekhov's dad. And the question was, how can you put Chekhov's dad on the mantle in the first act and not fire him off in the third act? And so for those of you who aren't familiar with this, this is a reference to Chekhov's gun, where uh, Chekhov was a a playwright and he said, if you have a gun on the mantle in the first act, it needs to be fired sometime in the third act. This basically comes down to don't put a bunch of extraneous detail in your story, but also if you're going to spend a lot of time setting something up, it needs to pay off, right? Right. And I'll give you that of Bam's backstory, we didn't get a whole lot of her dad, but we all know childhood stuff is very formative, right? And we saw on panel her professional choices were very much diametrically opposed to her father. Her father says, no more fantasy, no more mythology. And she says, well, I'll show you. I'll just prove that mythology and fantasy are actually real. And then he never comes back. Certainly not in this story. And I think very seriously He doesn't come back as part of why she becomes Cheetah. And what's more, looking forward a little bit, Ares isn't part of her transformation into Cheetah. I mean, maybe in some broad sense she becomes jealous of Wonder Woman and goes looking for other gods that might empower her. But that's not Ares, and it's not her dad, and it's not really Diana or Themyscira or any of the stuff that goes on in this story. So... Why did we spend so much time on her? Well, it's because she's going to be Cheetah. But by the way, none of the stuff we find out has to do with her being Cheetah. I don't like harshing other writers, but it's lazy. It just feels lazy. And, again, quoting some of my patrons, and I agree with them, it's also rage-inducing. You are invested in this story as much as you possibly can be. And when these things are sort of half-promised and then never paid off at all, for those of us who love story, that is difficult. It's upsetting. It's not the way that I want these things to work. And I think it's not the way that at least the folks who are showing up for uh, the live portion of these seminars want it to work. However... Those of you who are coming to this and listening after the fact, by all means, talk to me on Twitter, hashtag it SHU Wonder, so that everybody who is a patron or who shows up for the videos or who might take an interest later can come into the conversation. But I got to tell you, those of us that are here on the upfront find that all very confusing and upsetting, and I would love to hear an opposing viewpoint on that. All right, so moving forward, let's take a look at the beat breakdown of these three final issues. I also call this session Seriously, and you'll find out why as we go. So apparently the woman who trashed a jail cell by accident is still being held in the brig, 
and somebody's commanding officer is pretending that's his choice and not hers. I don't know if I ever get his rank, but on his shirt it says Michaels. And I do completely buy Michaels as a skeptic. He makes sense. He is a couple of rungs up the ladder. He is not having direct interaction with Diana. He is reading Steve's reports and Etta's reports instead of dealing with Diana directly. And he makes sense as a perfect skeptic. He's also a guy who's keeping his eye on the prize of the fact that there's a terrorist attack they were supposed to stop and they failed to do so. And maybe we should stop playing footsie with this possible Amazon and actually focus on that. So I I like where he's coming from. He makes total sense as a skeptic. To that end, I really like that Steve is now the hardcore believer and that it's entirely his interactions with Diana that have created that. Obviously, he's also the person who saw Themyscira. He's the person who got to fly home on an invisible jet. I mean, he has seen some things that would make believing difficult things easier to believe. But in this case, I really think it's his interaction with Diana that has done it for him. She is so sincere and she's so honest. She's so capital T true that he's prepared to buy into these things. And the shocking thing about that is that it's almost like Steve has a character trait, which is new. We haven't had one of those before from him. In the end, Michaels does give them permission to take Diana out on some leave. I have to tell you that there are parts of this scene, it takes a little, like many of the scenes in this, it takes a little too long for the point to be had. But the part where Diana slowly makes her way into the mall, noticing all the things, and she's falling in love with man's world. Everybody else is saying, is it too much? Is the noise too much? Is it overwhelming? Do you need to take a break? And instead, she's completely delighted by it. And I love that. Diana staring off at the horizon. Diana being excited to see the world outside of the island. Yes, some of that is from naivete, but also some of it is reflected here in her genuine delight at experiencing new things and experiencing a wider humanity than she had access to on Themyscira. One of the ways that island became a paradise is the population of it is very small and very specific. That doesn't mean that it's bad, but I love this as a character trait of Diana's, that she is super excited and enthralled by everything she discovers in Man's World. I am going to ask if it's a little weird that they took her to the mall in her armor. I thought that was a little strange. You're introducing her to the world. She doesn't speak the language. She's never seen any of these things. Apparently, we're led to believe that a six foot two woman is absolutely mind boggling to the world at large. So apparently she's going to just stand out even in normal clothes. But no, let's leave her in the red, white and blue stars and eagles armor. Eh, who will notice? Anyway, I know that at the end she needs to be in costume, which means in her armor. But I do feel like there would have been a really cool opportunity for her to do a spin around costume change similar to what Linda Carter would have done on the show. Another relatively subtle thing that I liked, in addition to Diana's delight, because again, she is delighted with man's world. But in addition to her delight, she is also starting to notice some of the problems with how women are depicted in man's world. She's noticing shoes that might be very uncomfortable to wear. She's noticing advertising that is a lot of very scantily clad women where their faces and heads are cut off, which I think is a big important deal of the things that she notices. They're they are bodies with no faces of women. If I think about this from a world building perspective, I'm not sure that these are actually things she would notice as wrong or troubling, seeing as how she comes from a culture that probably thinks about sex and nudity completely differently. Like we talked a little bit about that in the previous session. Odds are Amazons don't think about nude female forms and the sex that you might have with them in remotely the same ways that an American mall goer would. But at the same time, it's important that she start to understand there is bad with man's world as well as good. And so from that perspective, I like it. It works. But it does lead me to ask some questions that might be interesting grist for discussion in the meantime. What's Amazon fashion even like? 
I mean, they've been there for 3,000 years. Generally, it still looks like it's togas. Is that because nobody cared to look different or to innovate? Or is fashion completely an invention of man's world on some level? But if that's true about fashion, what about art or music? What does Amazon art look like? What does Amazon music sound like? Does it sound the same as it did 3,000 years ago? Did none of the women who died and came to Themyscira live their original lives as musicians or artists? It made me think a lot of big, writery, world-building thoughts about what Amazon fashion, art, music would be like. Aesthetics at all. What do they think about aesthetics at all? It's fascinating. Ethan says, to be fair, the average American mall goer doesn't notice either, and that's part of why it works. That's an interesting point. I'm going to push back against it a little bit because you're right. A big part of the objectification of women in our culture, especially in the culture of marketing, rests on the bedrock of it becoming background radiation, not something that we notice all the time. Interestingly enough, and I'm prepared to declare myself atypical in this fashion, but interestingly enough, I notice now. There are products from Victoria's Secret, for instance, that my wife prefers, and there's nothing wrong with that. By all means, if you like Victoria's Secret, go there. But when she is shopping for those items, we engineer it so that my son is not shopping with her. Because that store is overwhelmingly using marketing that objectifies women, even as it's marketed towards women, which I know it's also marketed towards men, and that men asking their women to go in there as part of the deal. It's, it's a complicated ball, right? It's so overwhelming there that even though I have to admit a big chunk of that objectification in marketing is background radiation to me, I stood next to my two or three year old boy and thought, this is probably the last time he should come in here. And it has been. I hustle him past it because the doors are open so wide. And it's not because I have some kind of strange puritanical strain in me. It's that I want to avoid as much of that wild objectification background radiation as I can while he's young and impressionable. So, again, I may not be the best example, but I'm going to point out I do notice now. I I see it more than I used to. I don't know if that means it's not working as well on me or not. In addition to Diana instantly loving man's world, children also love Diana, and she loves them in return. And that is great. And maybe this is the point of leaving her in the armor, is that even as an imposing, theoretically warrior-like figure, even so, the children come up to her directly and want to have interactions with her, and she immediately reciprocates. I really like both those storytelling elements for Diana in this moment. She tells them there were no other children on Themyscira. She was the only one. And obviously she didn't have an experience of herself as a child. Like she did not have a child to interact with. It was just her. She's never seen children before. She clearly knows what they are as a concept. These are where adults come from. Adults make these together. And so these are not quite entirely formed adults who need our protection and looking after. Because I do believe while she may have been the only child, that probably led to her being overparented, very deeply cared for, a treasure of the of the Amazons, right? And she takes the way that the Amazons treated her as the only child and then just turns and immediately applies it to every child. And I think that is great. I also like seeing that she is so smart. That now that she's actually out of the brig and being treated like a human being, she is starting to intuitively pick up on the language. It's being taught to her and she's learning it. There is a third story beat that I really appreciate here. Bam still thinks Steve is an idiot. I think we can all be team Bam in this moment. In the next scene, we have Diana explaining the gifts that she received from the patrons. And this is also a really great moment where I love to see the way that Diana sees her whole world. Because she says these most recent gifts are not the only gifts that she's ever had from the patrons. She talks about how some are very obvious, like Themyscira and the lives of her sisters. And I cannot tell you how much I love that sentiment. That the very lives of the women that she cares for are a gift from her gods. That a place for them to live where they could be safe and content 
was a gift from her gods. I mean, those are obvious. But think about how often you might take, or I take, that I know I take, those kinds of things for granted. And then she talks about how some of the gifts are meant to be discovered as she goes on. And the most obvious example of this are these new superpower gifts. We're going to discover them as she needs them. But I feel like the way she talks about that, it's part of a wider philosophy. And it's a philosophy that I think is really fascinating. And I think it actually comes up again later in the story. And I'll point out where. But I'm a big fan of the idea that here are the gifts from God or the gods that are right in your face and cannot be ignored. But that as you go, you will continue to discover them. And I feel like the nugget inside that is the more that you will look for them the more you will find them. I got to tell you guys, that's the kind of unexpected philosophy that I like to have snuck in on me from superhero comics. Ethan says, Heroes loving or being loved by children is a DC thing as compared to other companies. Kids on Batman the Animated Series are never scared of Batman. They know what he's for. Of course the kids love Wonder Woman. I don't disagree with you. And I'm actually going to point out, the Batman the Animated Series podcast that is in the works right now as we speak, we just watched an episode where there was a child who was afraid of Batman, but it was the mayor's son, and you can bet that in the mayor's household, he never heard anything good about Batman even once. And by the end of it, he and Batman are cool. So I I agree with you. And Kate says that kids can smell heroes and fear. You know, you're joking, but I'm sort of into that, right? Like, what's the opposite of somebody who's terrified and afraid is somebody who is willing to put their life on the line for others, a hero. So being able to smell both ends of that spectrum, I'm into that. Another book that we might look at for a superhero university would be New Frontier. And one of the things that I really like about New Frontier is that the uh, the writer-artist of that makes it a point that Batman lightens his costume up after he gets a Robin because he realized he needed to s- stop terrifying the children quite so much. And that's that's pretty cool. It's in the middle of this discussion of Diana's gifts that they discuss the perfect. And it happens accidentally. They all touch it at the same time, and suddenly they can understand one another. And what's more, they all start telling each other the truth. Etta and Bam have a moment here that we are going to see developed better or more fully in other scenes. But they say true things to one another that they have obviously been thinking a lot about because they are pretty deep truths which means that they have been thinking about each other a lot and deeply. I think it's also worth noting that Steve has very obvious floaty hearts. He never says anything, but he has floaty hearts. And I know that we're reading a comic book and that Diana did not see him actually have floaty hearts. But I think what we are supposed to take from that panel is that Diana knows for certain how Steve feels about her because he can no longer hide his deep affection, his love for her, that he is falling into romantic love with her, he can't hide it anymore. It's plain on his face because he's touching the perfect. I also think it's worth noting that Diana does not have floaty hearts back. So, of course, this moment of truth and love is ruined by violence, right? That is the way of man's world. Finally, some action, right? Finally, something is happening in this book. And it is an opportunity in the way that I was talking about last session. It's an opportunity for us to see what people are made of by externalizing some of the stuff that's going on with them internally. For instance, Steve and Etta are immediately people of action. They know what to do. They start spotting shooters. Etta begins saving a man's life. Steve begins shooting the attackers. They are people of action. They are highly trained. They know what they're doing, and they are now in their element. And they are working together, which I thought was really cool. And then there's Diana and the perfect, which is clearly at this point not just a strong rope. The way that you see it moves, it seems to be alive, or it obeys her. I don't know. There's a lot of things we could talk about with the perfect, but she's using it as an extension of herself. And the idea that it is perfect with a capital P and that it is a thing that compels the truth and that it will bend itself to Diana's will, I think says something about her inherent goodness. Remember, it's as strong as the heart that wields it. Don't forget that. It will keep coming up. It's at this moment that we discover that Diana is faster than a speeding bullet. 
It's also the first time that she blocks a bullet on panel. And it's actually a lot of bullets. And I'm going to take a few steps back and say, is this the moment that we were saving it for instead of seeing her do it on Themyscira? If it is, I get that compulsion, but I also wish they hadn't done it that way. I think it would have been really cool to see her block one or two bullets and have it be a really difficult thing. Like it's a thing she had to strain with all of her speed and strength to do. Ping, ping, block those two bullets. So we establish that as a baseline. And now in this moment, what do we see? She blocks thousands of bullets, hundreds of bullets, all in a second. So we establish what her previous baseline was and how incredible that is. And then we take it to another level in this moment. That's the way I would have done it, but whatever. Backseat driving is easy, hindsight 2020 and all that. I also really appreciate the nod to modernity that there are several people recording all this on their phones. Let's be honest. We know that this is the case. We know that a lot of our news comes from people who stop running away from the thing and to film it with their phones or whatever. We know that that's a thing. Now, I'd like to believe that these are smart people who threw themselves behind mailboxes or planters or something that would stop the gunfire. But then they stopped and they recorded it. And I really like that. That's the modern world we live in. And I like that so much more than when you spend a lot of time pretending that people aren't walking around with awesome cameras that are connected to the internet stuck in their pocket. I like it. Let's do that thing. And let me just say that that page of people recording her doing all of these heroic things is the first of many fantastic hero pages for Diana. And I really, really love this page. From there... Diana uses the perfect to make Steve a, a weapon. <laughs> it's not only clever thinking, but it makes me laugh because in a sense, isn't he already a blunt instrument? Oh, I think so. Coming back to Diana's naivete, I really like her question, why do they turn this into a battlefield? This was a place of commerce. It was a place of congregating. It was a place of food and drink and happiness and bright colors and noise, music. And now it is a place of carnage and the sounds of battle. And she's not angry. I mean, she is. She wants to put a stop to it. But more than anything, Diane is confused. And so here we are in an action scene, getting to see more of her character than I think we've seen in all the issues before this one. We also see some good quick thinking from Steve here. He sees the grenade. He grabs the perfect to make sure that Diana won't be confused. And then tells her to make sure the grenade does not explode. As a side note, I sort of wonder what word she heard in Amazon that would mean grenade. I'm just curious. It's not important to the story. I had these thoughts with Star Trek also with the Universal Translator computer. I'm always like, do they even have that concept? And this was one of those. But from there, we see two more of her gifts. We see both grace and invulnerability. She leaps from this high balcony, rolls into a crouch, as graceful as any dancer could be, and then covers the grenade with her hands. And whether that's strength or invulnerability, I'm not sure what we're supposed to take out of it. Maybe it's both. But she contains this destructive power of war with her hands. Pretty great moment. The battle is over. We have first responders. We get to see Etta is still being utterly competent, which I think is very good to see on the page. We see that Bam who was not useful during the fight, is still as cool as ice. Did she flip out and run away? No, she did not. In fact, I'm not sure about this now, but I'm going to go back. I want to go back and look. Is it possible Bam was the one who was holding the phone and recording it? That may be an easy question to answer. I'm not going to go look now, but that is a thing I'm very curious about, and I will go back and look to see if she was the one who actually caught all of the action on her phone. It's a little bit out of character in some ways, but in other ways, it's incredibly in character for her as a person who is calm under fire and a scientist at heart. Then we get another great Diana hero page. We discover she has another gift. She is flying and she's carrying Steve. And I have to be honest with you. I really wish that she were holding Steve in a matrimonial way. I don't know what else to call that, but it's that uh, the way that a groom would carry a bride over the threshold, the way that Superman is usually carrying Lois Lane, I would have loved it if Diana were carrying him down like that. It's the little things that entertain me. Okay, says the panel of her feet up swinging Steve is my favorite of the whole volume. Listen, 
It's pretty great. And for those of you who watched the little video that I had from the Brave and the Bold where Batman and Wonder Woman team up and Steve is just completely relying on her to do all the work. I'd like to see a Steve that's slightly more competent and useful than that, especially if he's going to be a military man. But let's be honest, he's the junior partner here, right? So the idea that he's useful, but only in so much as Diana can put him to work, I like it. Those are character things I can get behind. In addition to loving how cool Bam is under fire, I really like her snark here about the press. I don't think it's entirely earned, but it's conceivable that the press might be just as interested in the debut of a new superhero as they are interested in Diana's bra size, as Bam puts it. But at the same time, we want to keep bringing up these things that make man's world less than great. Not so that we can focus on the pessimistic side, but so that we can keep in mind the contrast between our better selves and our worse selves. And that ends that issue. We move into the next issue, where they are discussing the seer symbol. Diana has seen the symbol. Bam has seen the symbol. And now we know this is the symbol of seer. I have kind of a half-joking bullet point here where I say, if only we had had a reason to give a damn about seer before now. And I guess we kind of have. But remember, I talked in the last session about how laying some of these seeds in the earlier parts, hearing Steve's briefing on his mission and things like that, would have given us a place where these people finally understanding that they're all on the same page about something would have been a lot more interesting. That's where we're at. And the next chapter opens with a bit of a news recap. I like that Bam is famous enough to be mentioned along with her theories on the evening news. I love that. This is the part that makes me unsure of whether she is well-respected or if she is a laughingstock or a little bit of both. Because they mention her by name as though the viewers are going to know her, or at least some of them are going to know her. They mention her theories and how controversial they are. I just like a place where newscasters are like, oh yeah, well we that's obviously Barbara Ann Minerva. We recognize her on the video and everyone knows her work. I might be a little enamored with the idea of a BAM book, but here we are. BAM reacts to the evening news by exclaiming, Suffering Sappho. This is kind of a clever moment for me as comic book fan. For those of you who may not know, Suffering Sappho is one of Wonder Woman's old school fake swears. All the superheroes have fake swears. All the best superheroes have fake swears, all right? Green Lantern used to say, great guns, and Superman would say, great Krypton. There were all kinds of things like that. Lobo calls people Bastich, which is barely not a swear, right? So the fact that they work one of Wonder Woman's old school fake swears into this, and that it's Bam who does it, I kind of love it. This is also a place that we find out Sappho was a poet. So let me give you a little bit of background if you don't know. Sappho was a poet who lived on the island of Lesbos. This is where we get the term lesbian from, is that island. And sapphic love, another word for women who romantically or sexually are interested in women, is taken directly from Sappho's name. This is because Sappho's poems were mainly about love and women, and often at the same time, The fact that Wonder Woman back in the day used to say Suffer and Sappho, that's never been an accident, okay? Because Sappho is often equated with lesbianism or with romantic love between women, it can be used as a code word or a code phrase. A little less now in modern times, but it has been before. It's not a mistake that Etta and Bam are having a moment over their shared recognition of Sappho. In fact, you could note the blushing cheeks on Etta in the last panel of that page. Now, moving on though, this is when I realized that Victor was the dead guy with the seer tree on his chest. The man who stole her phone and who then was, I guess, trying to find the Amazons before she did. This will become a thing that makes sense, but it isn't right now. It's just more details. And we're kind of in the third act of this thing, and this is when I would like details to start falling into place. And you guys did catch me on missing some things in the previous issue. And I admitted that that might have been because I was a little bit bored by the previous issue. But this is the first time that I realized that Victor was that guy. That it was the same person that stole her phone that she was looking at that had the Seer brand on his chest. That's really useful and interesting. And it's a thing that I wish we'd either noticed then or had been made more explicit. 
It's also at this point that Bam describes what happened to that dig site as an act of God. It's cute. They're all slowly but surely starting to realize this is operating on a scale that they are not prepared for. From there, we get another great hero page for Diana of her just testing out her gifts. And I think that it's not for nothing that Steve is almost literally mooning all over her while she does it. I also love that one of her gifts is to understand everyone's language, even the animals. So whether that's one of her own gifts, or it's because of the perfect, or maybe it's a gift that is augmented by the perfect, I don't care. I love it. I mentioned in the previous session how much I like it when Wonder Woman dips into fairy tale princess stuff, which is why I liked that the gods were visiting her in animal form. This is a place where I feel like that really comes through. Now it's not just gods as animals. She's having conversation with hawks and with lizards. And let's be honest, the conversation she's having with the lizard is adorable. Sticking her tongue out at it, it's amazing. We then have a little character moment between Steve and Diana where Steve inadvertently puts his foot in his mouth about going home. Steve instantly assumes that Diana can't go home because she brought him home, which is in a way technically true, I feel like that's a very self-centered way to look at it, as though the world revolves around Steve. But I love Diana's response, and I'm going to clean up her pigeon English a little bit because I, I want it to come through with strength. Don't feel guilty. I didn't do it for you. I did it because it must be done. Now, she also did it for him. Diana feels for everyone. Compassion is one of her superpowers. She did do it for Steve. But in this moment, what he needs to hear is that she also did it for everybody else and to put that emphasis on it. This is the first time that Steve ever shuts up, and that's pretty great. He asks about Hippolyta, and that's pretty great. And then he asks about a significant other, and really? Seriously? Man, Steve, rough. Not the best moment for you to turn it around and make it all about you again. We do, however, get confirmation that Diana and Kazia were a couple, and I want to ask, why was this so hard to be really that sure about? I mean, we've suspected it from the first issue. This is our first 100% confirmation that they were a couple. If this were a Superman book, it would not be a mystery that Superman was into Lois Lane. They would be kissing on panel. We would know it. Why was it so difficult for us to know this about Diana and Kazia. It feels like a missed opportunity. Now I'm going to ask, what do we make of Diana taking Steve's hand? Does she just need human touch as comfort? Or is she starting to have romantic feelings for Steve? She definitely knows how he feels about her because of the perfect. And at least then we know that she did not reciprocate. So what's she doing here? Does she just need comfort? Is she starting to have romantic feelings? What is it? Kate says that she hated how he asked if she was single and then immediately they held hands. I agree. That is super gross. I don't like it. Whether the story means to or not, that actually takes Steve down a couple of pegs. They've gone a long way towards showing him to be strong but able to be in touch with his emotions, to be competent, but also not have a problem being the junior partner with Wonder Woman. But the fact that they are having an actual moment where Diana is confiding in him that she can never go home and that this clearly makes her very sad. She's happy to do it. It's her duty and she is proud to do it. But it clearly makes her very sad. And he turns it into an opportunity to see if she's available. Not your best moment, Steve Trevor. It's why for me, I read the hand-holding as Diana being extremely lonely in that moment and needing human contact that is not romantic at all. I don't think she's interested in Steve. Not really. Not at this point. I'm prepared to be argued with because it's not clear, but in that moment to me, she just needs the comfort of knowing that there is somebody else in the world who knows who she is and thinks she's good, who wants to be her friend. Kate points out it also smells like she was gay right up until there was a dude available. I read this as much worse for Steve. I didn't immediately go to that spot. But since that has been brought up more than once, that maybe Diana is gay right up until Steve shows up and turns a straight ray on her. Yeah, it's not. It's not great. It does not do wonders for the story. 
Good point. Thank you, Kate. Then we waste an entire page of Steve telling everyone in a room stuff that we already know because we just saw the last couple of pages. And if ever there were a metaphor for the rest of the story, I feel like that's it. Then Diana tastes Coke. And I got to tell you guys, I haven't had an entire soda in years. And now when I taste it, I have the same reaction as Diana. So I don't know that that was a necessary moment, but it was one that I could identify with. Through some various conversation, Diana decides that she will talk to the terrorist, and I feel like getting the woman with a lasso of truth to talk to the prisoners seems like such a good idea, I'm surprised that we're just now having it. Explaining terrorists has some interesting possibilities, and I like Diana's question, why make war where there is peace? This is a great question, but it also, in this moment, feels like a bit of a missed opportunity, and I would equate it to the same kind of missed opportunity from the movie, when Chief is talking about America, and how America is the reason that his people don't have anything left. Steve's people are the reason that his people are destitute. And that script just leaves that laying on the table with no reaction from Diana. I feel like someone making it clear that there is never some place where there is always peace in man's world would have been a good moment. I do, however, appreciate that Bam boils it all down to hate. Because that's that's kind of the point that I made about World War I in the first session. When you just look at war as an instrument of hate, and that sometimes the reason you hate people is as stupid as they live over there, or they look a little different from me, that is absolutely a thing that Diana, as a person who stands outside of man's world and its systems, can look at and go, yeah, but that's stupid. And we all have to kind of agree that she's right. Here we are now, ladies and gentlemen, a third of the way through the final issue, and threads are... Oh my gosh. That's a mistake. I said a third of the way through the final issue in my notes because I still hadn't realized that there was another issue after this one. We're going to talk more about that when we get there. But let me say, here we are a third of the way from through the penultimate issue and threads of this story are finally starting to come together. I've said it before, but I feel like that should have been happening in the second act. But whatever, it's too late now. I love Diana in this moment, though. You're going to hear me say that a lot. I love Diana a lot here in the end of this story when she says all kinds of things. But in this moment, what she says is, I will talk to the seer man. I will find the truth. She's so forthright. I love that. She's not going to beat it out of him like Jack Bauer. She's not going to go in there and scare it out of him like Batman. And kids, I love Batman, but that's not what she's going to do. She is going to go in there and she is going to find the truth. And she will do it by talking to him. Now Diana is in the room with one of the seer terrorists. I notice that she doesn't force him to touch the perfect, but she does encourage it. She takes his hand, and it looks very gentle in the art. She's not struggling against him. And she just sets his hand on the perfect so that they can have a serious talk. And the fact that she doesn't force him, that she doesn't just go in there and loop him up, she comes in there and non-verbally asks him, to join her in this conversation and he does it and I think that there's something to be said for Diana's character in that moment right now we get some of what's going on with Seer and the man's first exclamation of fear panic discord and war this is not an accident Ares the god of war had three children I think he had more children but these are the three we care about Phobos Deimos and Eris Phobos, who you might recognize in our word phobia, Phobos means fear. Demos means panic, and Eris means discord or strife. Fear, panic, and discord are the children of war, in that Phobos, Demos, and Eris are the children of Ares. And I have to tell you that I found this man's babbling legitimately terrifying. Not the least of which because he's talking about all the death and destruction that is going to happen and insists that it's in man's nature for that to be the way the world is. But in the end, he breaks down in sobs and begs for forgiveness. He apologizes. I don't know, maybe I'm reading more into this than anyone else did, but I'm reading his voice being very angry. Fear, panic, discord, war, there will be blood in the streets, it will flow, you know, all that stuff. And then in the end, it just breaks down to sobs and saying how sorry he is. Even as it's part of our nature, 
he doesn't in that moment want it to be. And that kind of makes the whole thing really scary for me. Throughout this babbling, it's not just one of the seer terrorists. It changes from panel to panel. So Diane is hearing the same thing from different men. And that actually adds to the fear of it all for me. Like, it's terrifying that these men are spouting exactly the same thing, but with so much energy. This isn't just doctrine that they're reciting. This is not just the terrorist version of name, rank, and serial number. These are things that they feel at the core of their being. And the idea that they were all saying the same thing about fear, panic, discord, war, and what the virus would do to people leads me to feel like they all, in the end, broke down into sobs, even though we only saw that in one person. Again, I might be thinking about this page way more than anybody else, but it was uh, it was pretty impactful. It was pretty powerful to me. So I liked the Easter egg of both the virus and Dr. Poison from the movie drawing from the same earlier villain in Wonder Woman comics in a way that acknowledges we have all this history, but at the same time does not in any way make that villain a Yellow Peril villain. I mentioned Yellow Peril in a previous session. In American and English stories, there was a fear of the Far East. They were so different than us. They believe different things. They live a different way. Their philosophy is different. It's East versus West. And all that othering caused us to make some pretty sweeping judgments about Eastern Asians that now we kind of talk about as a yellow peril villain. A Mandarin from Iron Man fell into this category. Ra's al Ghul nods towards it while also taking steps away from it. Like, he's a very pulp-flavored villain in that way. At any rate, as they're describing what the Maru virus will do, it kind of sounds to me like super rabies, which is cool. Like, that's definitely a thing that would be concerning. That kind of adrenalized attack everybody, hate everybody, fight everybody. But it makes me wonder, if that's the case about the Maru virus, were these men infected with it? And if they were... How come they weren't constantly attacking the guards until somebody had to stop them with a gun or knock them out or sedate them? Or why weren't they beating themselves against the wall until they died? I mean, it's not a pretty question, but I feel like it's a good question. Maybe those men were not meant to have been infected with the Maru virus as far as the story is concerned. I was a little unclear on that. And at any rate, the idea that the Maru virus will be delivered upon multiple vectors, you can breathe it, you can eat it, you can drink it, and it will happen in multiple population centers, that is an easy delivery to get a massive body count. It is a good escalation of the situation. It's kind of an escalation from zero to 60, because we didn't know any of this, and apparently other characters in the story did, but it definitely makes it a worldwide problem that a Wonder Woman could solve, right? Edda starts talking about Steve's plane going down and failing the mission that they were going to use to blow up the factory making the Maru virus and says, it seems like the fates have been against us. I thought that was a really interesting line because I can understand from her perspective why she would say that. But from another perspective, have the fates actually been for them all this time? Making Steve's plane crash brought the only person to you who could stand against Ares. So are the fates against you? Or are the fates just working in a roundabout way to be for you? Which, again, sounds very much like the fates of Greek mythology. Interesting question about whether the fates are for them or against them aside. This is when they really get serious about the seer group and what they are and what they want. And now is the time when I'm going to take a moment to have a conversation that we had some in chat about how terrible that name is. Seer is just not as clever as the story wants it to be. And Bam figuring out that Seer is an anagram for Ares is some straight-up Batman 66 free association style crime solving that borders on aphasia. And are any of us surprised at this point? Who didn't know that Ares was going to wind up being behind all this, right? We had a gate to what we don't know, but it attacked Diana. And Hippolyta tied that directly to Ares. And we're talking about a guy who just named Ares and all his kids in English. Who didn't know Ares was going to be behind this? Even those of you new to the scene, at least thanks to the movie, knew that Ares was probably the guy. And I'm going to, again, nod towards Kate and say, name the group Mars. Or even ARMS if you have to do an anagram. 
it at least makes more sense for a terrorist group that's dedicated to literal war to name yourself after weapons. That also happens to be an anagram for the name of the god of war that Diana would not immediately recognize. Nevertheless, Bam pointing this out to Diana allows her to figure it out that Ares is behind all of this exactly at the moment that Ares shows up. Why did we even mess with all of the mystery and its supposed problem solving? I don't know. But I really like the final image of this page revealing Ares, and I like it especially in contrast with the first page of the next chapter because they work amazingly well together. I bet in the collection they worked even better since that final page is looking at Ares and that next page of the next chapter is the exact reverse of looking at our heroes from over Ares' shoulders. Pretty great. Pretty great. Note, Ares' vipers are slithering around his shoulders. They look eerily like the one that poisoned Diana. We are instantly introduced to how incredibly powerful Ares is. We see immediately that Ares wants Steve. He says Steve has something that Ares needs. That's pretty cool. I wish it was a thing that had somehow been introduced to us earlier on. Like, that would be really great, wouldn't it? To know that Steve, who we've just been told is a person of destiny up to this point, to have Ares actually focused on him and us to know that, would have shown not told that information. I like that Steve is still headstrong here. He's a man of action. He's trying to do something. He tries to stab Ares, but I'm also pretty impressed with the idea that this knife just disintegrates. And I'm going to read between the lines there a little bit and just assume that that's because weapons of war will not hurt war himself as opposed to he's got an energy field or something. I want to get mythological with it. So even though Steve has something Ares wants, Wonder Woman will not be stopped. I want to point out, suddenly all of Wonder Woman's dialogue with Ares is filled with these, thines, and thous. But we're also back to that font that shows that she's speaking in Amazonian. Right away, she is showing respect for Ares. He is not one of her patrons, but he is a contemporary of her patrons and is therefore deserving of her respect. As a side note, I really like the bits about Bam translating what they're saying in their conversation on the fly and how it's a little bit different. It's not necessary, but it really entertains me and again shows that Bam is cool as ice and literally the smartest person in the room. Also, thanks to Kate, this is an opportunity to point out that Steve has lost his shirt again. And I don't think he's ever going to get one back, or at least not for a really long time. We are going to, at the end of this, discuss some of the female gaze and whether this book actually came through on it or not. We'll talk more about that as we go, but we're in the thick of action and I don't want to get distracted right now. Thinking about the stuff that I love about superheroes, externalizing that internal problem. Diana literally tries to talk it out with war. She even supplicates herself to him. And it even seems like Ares is taken aback by that. And with good reason. If your entire being is devoted to violence, it is going to be a surprise to you when your enemy responds with something other than violence. I mean, clearly it's an atypical response, and it's maybe even an atypical response for an Amazon. We may be seeing an, another example of Diana being head and shoulders above even her sisters at this point. I love Diana in this scene. You've heard me say it before. You're going to hear me say it a lot. But the line, I plead for peace, for life, that was a hell yeah moment for me. She is on her knees and already we know she's winning. We don't know how she's going to win, but we know she's winning. Ares cannot beat this woman who is willing to kneel in front of him in the name of peace and life. Ethan asks, where the hell is that kind of, that trying to talk it out with war is actually a great moment. It's a great moment and it's a great character beat. And where is that kind of awareness in the rest of the book? I agree. Again, we'll come to it. So we'll talk about it a lot. But there are some amazing moments here at the end. And I'm not sure that they are entirely earned, but they could have been. And I know that they're great moments because even though they weren't earned, I am still in for them, right? So it turns out the thing that Ares is after is the location of his daughters, the location of Themyscira. Now my question here, is that what the Seer group was about from the beginning or are they two separate things? 
was Ares behind the Seer group just trying to create strife and chaos and death because that's what Ares does? And it just so happened that the fates or the patrons or whatever brought Diana from the island to face him? Or was Ares focus always on finding Themyscira and he was creating and backing the Seer group to create a space where an Amazon would be brought to him and he could use her to find the island? It's a little unclear I think it's kind of okay that it's unclear. The answer could also be both, and it wouldn't disappoint me, but it's something that I thought about at this point. Kate, that's a good point. They're soldiers up there, right? And she's not doing the thing that soldiers would do, and yet no one who is watching this situation thinks that Wonder Woman is giving up or whatever. They don't know what she's doing, but they know why she's doing it, and they have faith in her ability to get the job done. This is also the moment when everyone watching is starting to understand the scale of things, the period on that sentence is Bam herself realizing that they are in the literal presence of actual gods of myth. She sees it. She sees the owl. She sees the stag. She realizes we are in the presence of gods. This is big. It's, it was already big, right? The world is literally in danger from the Maru virus, from the Seer group. But friends, it just got bigger because gods are involved. And she's not wrong. That's definitely a way to ratchet up the scale. Kate makes an excellent point. Kate says, I don't think Ares' job of destroying the earth with war could be complete without crushing the Amazons. That is excellent. And Ethan asks, does he really win if there's this enclave of peace and understanding that survives? These are good questions. I really like that. It makes the both answer of that he is both trying to destroy the world and draw out the Amazons very satisfying. I'm very satisfied by that answer. That's fantastic. Good good call. Now, it's in this moment that Diana seems as though she is willing to give Ares the information that he needs. So she says, if it is mine to grant, great god of war, that knowledge is thine. And that's why I say it seems as though she's willing to give. Because she knows that she left Themyscira behind forever. And so there's a certain part of her. Again, we are dealing with a Diana that is very smart. A woman who has been gifted by Athena just as much as any other god or goddess. This is a woman who is thinking in terms of strategy. She is thinking multiple moves ahead. And there has to be a part of her that knows if she left Themyscira behind forever and cannot return to it, Part of her curse must be that she cannot remember its physical location. Now, we've brought up the idea that perhaps there is no physical location for her to remember in the way that she means it or that Ares means it. But nevertheless, she's looking ahead to that. That's what she thinks. So she seems to give in to Ares and then she suffers on our behalf. When Ares is trying to take the information from her, it hurts. It is not a good time for Diana. And when he fails to come to that information, he's very angry. This is the moment that I talked about earlier where I think that the Amazon philosophy of some of the gifts are meant to be found along the way. This is a moment where Diana realizes that losing her memory of her home's location, the thing she had been thinking of as a curse that she could never return home, is also a gift of the gods. And she just discovered it. Ares goes on to talk a few things, and he does have a point about Diana's chosen friends, in my opinion. They are warriors. They are soldiers. They are people who have made war their business, and that's who she calls friends. And then he makes the point that the world is his. He has taken it, at which point we have another amazing Diana moment. Then from you, we will take it back. It's another opportunity to love Diana. She is a consummate guardian and protector and never stops being the most badass person in the scene. Diana battles Ares with the clear assistance of the animal avatars for Athena and Artemis. And I don't think that those two being the ones who take direct action in the fight are an accident. Athena, the goddess of war and heroic glory, her aspect of war is much more the strategy and planning. And Artemis, who is the virgin goddess of the hunt. I don't think it's an accident that those two are the ones involved. And then we discover that even Ares can be bound by the perfect. 
And then Diana finally defeats him. But she defeats him not by killing him or destroying him, but because he so cannot stand to be bound that he discorporates. He stops being that physical form. And he bursts into ravens, snakes, and dogs. It's very important from a mythological aspect that he bursts into those animals. The dogs, as in let loose the dogs of war, are straight out of mythology. In fact, a lot of times Phobos and Deimos are depicted as dogs. Ares is often depicted with war dogs, hounds of war, in his entourage. When he is depicted, he often has them alongside him. Usually, for Greek perspective, he would be shown with vultures, but ravens are a much more European choice, and we are, of course, an Euro-American reading audience. So bursting into ravens, those are battlefield birds. They come after the battle to peck at the dead bodies. So they are often birds of war. This is why Odin, for instance, has ravens as his familiars. So it would have been more accurate mythologically to have them be vultures, but we're going with imagery at this point, right? Which is important to point out because the snakes make no sense whatsoever as far as mythology was concerned. Ares was not equated with snakes. However, we're hearkening back to that dead tree, viper in the garden of paradise, biblical imagery. So it makes sense. Kate points out something that I missed in that picture with the animals. All of those animals are also surrounded by a swarm of flies, which of course are pestilence that comes after a battle. Also not mythological in terms of Greece, but makes a lot of sense to us as imagery of war and death. As soon as the battle is over, Diana is thankful and humble. And again, we see her character in these moments of action. She says to the goddesses, if I won here today, it's because of you. I mean, she did the most of the work, but she also recognizes if you don't do it with me, I couldn't have done it. Now that Diana has defeated Ares, they get the Maru virus plan via an almost literal deus ex machina. Athena, in the form of an owl, gives it to them on a smartphone. That's really great. So for those of you who don't know, deus ex machina means God in the machine or God in the apparatus, and it originates in Greek theater. There was a trope, I guess you would say, in Greek tragedy where the human beings in that the players were human beings who got themselves in as much trouble as they possibly could. It was the worst possible situation that human beings could get themselves into. And then at the end of the play, when everyone realized there was no way that they could fix this, the actors that played the gods would descend from on high in a rope and pulley system. They would be standing on a platform that would be lowered onto the stage so that the gods would show up and say, silly mortals, this is how you fix it. And then the gods would put everything to right or as close to to right as they were going to. And because this was a trope that kept happening and the gods were literally delivered by an apparatus, the term deus ex machina comes to play. I agree with Ethan. When there are actual gods on the scene, I do not have nearly the problem with deus ex machina as I normally would. And the idea that Athena, who is wise and who makes battle plans, is the one who gives it to them, I am also perfectly fine with. If I'm honest, I'm also perfectly fine with the fact that Steve is the one who states the obvious of, there is an owl on my shoulder using my phone. It's fantastic. And suddenly, because we have this plan, we know that the threat was even larger than we knew. We're not talking about a handful of huge metropolitan areas being hit by this Maru virus. We're talking about every single huge metropolitan area in the world, including the UN. So we're going to get the leadership also. So now that the threat is even larger than we expected, how are we to deal with it? Michaels says, get me General Simone, which is another fun little Easter egg. I mentioned uh, there was a doctor in the previous session who was Dr. Perez, one of the previous architects of Wonder Woman's world. This General Simone references Gail Simone, another beloved Wonder Woman writer, and one I quoted at the beginning of session one. She's the one who says, if you got to stop an asteroid, you send Superman. If you got to solve a mystery, you call Batman. But if you need to stop a war... You call Wonder Woman. It's only right that General Simone be the one who is called at this moment. So the problem of the attack is too big and they don't have time to stop it. 
I'm a little confused by this because then it appears that they do stop it by Diana flying around with a shirtless Steve to tell everybody to do something with the gas. The reason that this confuses me is if it was that easy, why can't it just be done with a phone call? Like, I know Wonder Woman is great, but she's only had one public appearance. Not everybody in the world knows who Wonder Woman is. And Steve is important as a, I guess, a member of a SEAL team and is privy to a bunch of intelligence, but his rank is not so high. He should be able to go to all of these cities all around the world and tell them what to do. If the presence of Wonder Woman and Steve Trevor flying to these places, I don't know how fast she flies, but if it's fast enough to get to all these places quicker than a phone call, Steve is dead. So I like that only Wonder Woman with the help of Steve can solve the problem, but I don't feel like it's presented in a way that makes it understandable why they couldn't just pick up the phone and call everybody. However, we end at the United Nations, and I love that it's Diana who figures out from Ares' clues that the gas is going to be let loose at a school. One of the reasons I like this is because it shows Diana's cleverness again, that she is smart, that she is on task and can put disparate pieces together into a new whole. But the other thing that I like is Ares was boasting. This isn't like a Batman villain where they are compelled to send riddles or clues or whatever. Ares said exactly what he meant to say. He said it plainly as far as he's concerned. (laughs) Plain for a god is still pretty flowery and poetic, but Diana is able to see this. She flies to the school with Steve in tow, finds the terrorists holding all the kids in the bomb. I don't love that it's a ricochet off of Diana's van brace that hits the tanks. I don't like that she is the one who, even inadvertently, creates the more dangerous situation. It feels like it undermines her somewhat. Why didn't the guy just hit the button while she was busy blocking bullets from hitting the kids, right? Pretty simple. So while I don't love that it's Diana who creates more danger, I do love that she is infected by the gas and that she begins to believe the lies that Ares tells about humanity. She gets angry. She gets violent. She gets destructive. But in the midst of that, she realizes that those are lies. That is not what is at the core of humanity. The truth of this thing is that we, including the Amazons, and maybe especially Diana, are better than that. And she overcomes the gas. Now, she does it with the help of the perfect. But we've also established that the perfect is as strong as the heart of the person who wields it. So, chicken and egg. Diana's heart or the perfect? Which one helped her overcome the gas? Now then what happens to the gas? I'm not sure. There's a bright flash of light and then the gas is gone. But we are dealing with fairy tale stuff and gods. So magic. Diana saves the day. Steve is awestruck and they hug. I kind of hate it at this point that it's Steve she hugs. But I love that Diana fights and ends the fight with a hug. She doesn't end the fight with a hug. But when the fight's over... She hugs. I can't imagine Batman doing that. I can't even imagine Superman doing that. That's a Wonder Woman thing. And I love it. Now we have an epilogue. Etta is plying Bam with booze. And let me tell you, I would read the Etta Candy and Barbara Ann Minerva fly around the world being in love and solving mysteries comic all day. Bam Candy. DC. Hire me. I will write it. It will be great. We will all be happy. Trust me. I like that in the scene, Diana is not wearing her armor. She's wearing civilian clothes and she looks adorable. Steve shows up with newspapers that have given Diana her superhero name. So now she's Wonder Woman, which is great. But I also have to ask, why? She did say, I wonder, I wonder a lot before realizing that it was a school being attacked. Did the media overhear her saying that, Steve, I wonder, before flying off? Her name is such a big deal that you think you'd build a bigger moment for it. I love the moment when Lois says, this Kryptonian symbol looks like an S. Let's call him Superman, right? I love the moment that somebody screams, oh no, it's the Bat, and suddenly Batman has a name. 
it's cool that all of these newspapers have agreed to call her Wonder Woman inexplicably. I think that detail being unexplained is good. But why Wonder Woman? Just a question. I wish I had a better answer for. And that's the end. That is the end of Wonder Woman Rebirth Year One. I leave you with a few story questions that you are welcome to join us on Twitter, hashtag SHUWonder. Or, if you'd like to become one of my patrons and have a much more robust conversation in our Discord chat, you're welcome to do it. But these are the things that I am left wondering. Let's talk about the female gaze for a moment. You get a lot of shirtless Steve at various points here at the end of the book. I am not the best person to gauge how well or how poorly they serviced the female gaze. My gut reaction is not very well. The fact that Kate has been in the chat making jokes about how Steve is shirtless again and again and then for a really long time tells me that at least at least one woman does not feel like she has been served. And I think in comparison to the movie, it's not great either. The movie made a big deal of shooting Steve in the way that the female love interest would be shot in any other movie. The camera looks down at him. The lighting is often very soft. He looks up and adoring at the viewpoint, which is usually Wonder Woman. The movie did a better job, in my opinion, of servicing the female gaze. However, maybe I'm wrong. What do you guys think? Another story question and concern. I think it's clear that this story wasted a lot of time and space at the beginning and that the end suffers for it. There were a lot of ways that this could be done better, and a lot of those moments at the end could have been more earned. However, the thing I can definitely say is, Diana looks amazing in the end. Wonder Woman looks amazing in the end. And some of those great moments that aren't earned as well as I'd like them to be, still feel earned, even with the wasted space at the beginning. So even in spite of a whole story that loose, the pages of her visiting with the gods, learning her gifts, saving people, standing up to Ares, overcoming the poison, all of the places that you want Wonder Woman to be luminous, she absolutely was, even with the less than spectacular first and second acts. Do you all agree with that? Do you think that that space was wasted? Do you think that we could have tightened these threads better? That Chekhov's dad or Chekhov's Ares or Chekhov's terrorist group set on the mantle and then left to gather dust until the last few pages? Do you think we could have used them better? Clearly, I have an axe to grind there, and I'm doing it with those words. But I'm curious. Lastly, did you enjoy this enough to keep reading Wonder Woman comics? And I have that question for two different sets of people. For the people who are fans of superhero comics but have never read a Wonder Woman comic, does this make you want to dig in more to the character and see what she's doing? For those of you who came here with maybe only the movie or Glenda Carter or even less, but you now read this book, does it make you want to read more of her adventures? And for those of you that are my patrons, I'll ask you those questions with the addition of, does it make you want to read more Wonder Woman comics to the point that we should look at them together? That's another conversation that I feel like we should take to Twitter and to Discord. And that's where I'll leave it. Thank you all very much for listening. It has been a pleasure to walk through this story with you. And don't worry, even though we're done with Rebirth Year One, we are not done with Superhero University. I'm going to keep doing this for different characters and different storylines, and that includes another look at Wonder Woman sometime in the future. Right now, I'm running a poll on my Patreon for patrons of a certain level, and it looks like we're going to dive into the Batman end of the DC pool, but anything can change. Go and take a look at the Patreon, and if you want to become a patron, take part in the poll. It'll be about a week from when this goes live, depending on when you listen to this. You may still have time. Go check it out. For those of you that have enjoyed what you heard as I did this about Wonder Woman, just leave this in your feed. When I do more Wonder Woman and update with those episodes, it'll show up in your podcast app of choice. For those of you who want to follow me to the next character, again, I suggest just leave this podcast in your feed because I will do a short special episode of Wonder Woman Superhero University to explain who we're doing next so you can follow me over there. And here at the end of this first Superhero University, I guess I declare that class, for now at least, is no longer in session.
See you next time. Superhero University is a Pulp Diction Productions program and is 100% supported by listeners like you. To find out how you can keep this and our other shows in production, check out patreon.com slash pulpdictionproductions.